Right, so good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for joining today's event. Uh, I'm Jonathan from the Cambridge Society for Economic Pluralism, or CSEP, and I'll be moderating today's event. Uh, first, some things about the society. CSEP is a society run by a dedicated team of students, united by the belief that progress in economics will and should be driven by an increasingly interdisciplinary approach. Uh, CSEP aims to enrich the understanding of economics within Cambridge, promote alternative views on conventional thought, and make the discipline more applicable to the real world uh, problems. Um, today's panel is on the topic, understanding the global payment system. We'll begin with 15 minutes allocated to both speakers to make opening comments, leaving the next hour or so for a moderated discussion, uh, which I'll kick off before opening questions to the floor. And the event should last until 5.30 p.m. We're very happy today to be joined by Dr. Peter Stella and Mr. Joseph Wang. Peter is a 25-year veteran of the IMF, where his positions included Head of the Central Banking and Monetary and Forex Operations Divisions. He has provided macroeconomic policy advice to governments in Asia, Europe, the Middle East, and Latin America. He resided in Bulgaria from 1997 to 2001, while he was the IMF's resident representative. During that time, Bulgaria recovered from devastating hyperinflation and began preparing for its successful entry into the EU. Peter also received his PhD in economics from Stanford in 1985 and has undertaken extensive research on fiscal and monetary policy interactions with a particular focus on restructuring the sovereign balance sheet. He was also one of the first economists to analyze the relevance of central bank capital for monetary policy and coined the term policy solvency in that context. He curates the website Central Bank Archaeology where he will also be uploading a lot of the discussion material from today's call. Uh, Joseph is the CIO of Monetary Macro, author of Central Banking 101, and operator of the website fedguy.com. Earlier in his career, he was a senior trader on the Fed's open markets desk, a credit analyst at S&P Ratings, and an attorney in New York. His work aims to shed light on what often appears to be an opaque system and to bridge the gap between academia and practice when it comes to financial markets. Joseph also holds a BA in economics from Northwestern, a JD from Columbia Law School, and an MSc in financial economics from Oxford. Without further ado, I'd like to pass the time to Peter to begin his introductory remarks, uh, followed by Joseph. Peter, please. Thank you, Jonathan, for that kind introduction and for uh, inviting me to speak to you all today. It's appropriate that I begin with a shout out to a famous Cambridge professor. No not an economist, but a philosopher, Ludwig Wittgenstein. He was, of course, an associate of Keynes and quite close to Piero Sraffa and Frank Ramsey. If you haven't read Ray Monk's biography of Wittgenstein, The Duty of Genius, I highly recommend it. For me, Wittgenstein's outlook can best be summarized in two phrases. The aim of philosophy is to free us from the hold that certain words or forms of expression have on us. And we eliminate misunderstandings by making our expressions more exact. Words don't have intrinsic meanings. They obtain their meanings from how people use them in common language. So meanings are derived from popular usage. If we're not precise in our scientific definitions, this characteristic of words can lead to unfortunate consequences. To give one example, the term QE or quantitative easing this was a policy adopted by Japan in the 1990s. It was a total failure. When the Fed started its large scale asset purchases in the 2010s, I knew Fed Chair Ben Bernanke, who was one of our professors at Stanford, would not use the term QE, anything but QE, because QE was a failure. More seriously, what the Fed and other central banks did was different from what Japan had tried a couple of decades earlier. The Fed called its policy credit easing. Unfortunately, the subtlety was lost on the financial press and markets and almost all economists. The different policies undertaken by the Fed, the Bank of England, ECB, the BOJ during the midst of the global financial crisis were all called QE. And subsequent actions, QE2, an illusion that was just too cute to pass up. And then Q3, QE3 and QE infinity. But this was simply wrong from an analytical perspective. What the Fed did at the beginning was not Japan's QE, nor was the second round of large scale asset purchases the same as the first. There were significant differences among the various policies adopted, but the hold of QE on our minds has made it virtually impossible to talk sensibly 
about all those policies subsumed under that general appellation. Regrettably, generations of economic historians writing about this episode will undoubtedly not being monetary policy specialists perpetuate a misleading narrative, all because of the impact of the hold of the term QA, QE on their ability even to think of different flavors of QE. It is if we insisted that the indigenous people of the Arctic who have a dozen words for different types of snow, wet snow, dry snow, icy snow, could only record in their weather journals, snow or no snow. It's borderline criminal. I find it apropos that the only pupil of Wittgenstein to write anything remotely philosophical, Maurice O'Connor Drury, entitled his collection of essays, The Danger of Words. This afternoon, the dangerous word I want to talk about is money. We all think we know what it is, what it does, where it is, where it goes, but do we really? I would conjecture that we know less about money now than we did 300 years ago when Sir Isaac Newton was master of the Royal Mint. Modern misunderstandings about money are appalling and dangerous. The misconception about money I will discuss today is perhaps the most misleading and dangerous. This misconception, put simply, is that more payments require more money. That idea is absolutely and plainly false. And the reason I entitled my remarks, payments without money. Let me here provide one bit of evidence that more payments do not require more money. The annual value of payments affected through Fedwire, the primary US payment system, increased by about 50,000% between 1957 and 2007, from one trillion to $671 billion. While the deposits held at the Federal Reserves by banks, the funds used to make those payments fell by 37% to only $14 billion in 2007. Explain that fact if you think it's necessary to have more money to make more payments. I hope at this point you are at least mildly shocked. In what follows, I will try to convince you that it is no more necessary to have more money to make more payments than it is necessary to have more electrons to make more electricity or to, to require more ink, paper, and envelopes to send more letters electronically. But before I begin, let me posit several predictions based on my conjecture. First, the current hugely inflated central bank balance sheets we're currently seeing will eventually shrink during your lifetime, not mine, asymptotically to zero, if not completely to zero. Second, the term money will drop into scientific obscurity, a process that is well underway. Third, Crypto coins are extremely unlikely to ever be used in large quantities to make payments. I'm not downplaying the associated technological innovations, just the coins themselves. Now, how is it possible for quadrillions of dollars of payments to be made with so little money? Let me start with an analogy. There's a bus that runs from Union Station in Washington, DC, to Grand Central Station in New York City, a distance of about 226 miles. The journey takes about four hours one way, almost exactly the same as traveling between London and Liverpool by bus. Discounting time for refueling, maintenance, et cetera, one bus could make exactly three round trips in 24 hours. If a bus could take 100 persons, then 300 persons could take a round trip um, to New York in a day. If the bus, uh, sorry, if 300 persons wanted to take that, uh, uh, sorry, if 300 persons wanted to take that trip, you would need uh, three buses. If 600 persons wanted to take that trip, you would need six buses, 900, 900 persons, uh, and so on. From this one might legit legitimately make the claim that there's a linear relationship between the number of people who want to travel and the number of buses or vehicles required. If we followed this line of thinking in the monetary world, we would get the famous quantity theory of money, a linear relationship between payments and money required. Now, 
Let's imagine the company buys a bus that travels at half the speed of light. And that's roughly the speed that data flows through modern networks. It would take that bus not four hours to make the trip, but 2.5 milliseconds. So the time it takes me to say this sentence, the bus could make 1,440 round trips. In a day, the bus could make almost 18 million round trips. And taking 100 persons at a time, that would be close to 1.8 billion people. That's more than five times the entire population of the US. In that world, there obviously is no meaningful correspondence between the number of buses and the number of people moves. All you are likely to need is one bus and one dedicated bus lane. Now you may be thinking, eh, good story, but is money the bus or is money the people? The answer is neither. In modern payment systems, money does not move in physical space. It doesn't travel. What happens is records are adjusted in databases in the cloud. Is the cloud in New York, New Jersey, Florida, Iceland, London? Ledgers are updated on the basis of validated transfer of ownership requests. For example, transfer alpha from A to B, where A and B are account addresses and alpha is the currency amount. They are routed through a network after being validated, verified, documented. In my analogy, the bus passengers are the messages and the dedicated bus lane is the network through which the messages pass. And yes, at some point, you would need a second bus and a second dedicated traffic lane, an increase in bandwidth, so to speak, if you needed to transport more than 1.8 billion people in a day. Now, you may ask if the passengers are just instructions, then how does the money get from one place to another? Well, I've already mentioned that money doesn't travel. The ownership of it just changes and those ownership instructions are analogous to the passengers. Most US security trades agreed on Wall Street in New York, say for example, between a Danish teacher's pension fund and a Japanese investment bank are recorded in a database in Jacksonville, Florida. Indeed, why should money move if it can winter in sunny Florida? That neither money nor securities travel is very important to grasp. Let's, trans let's transition to international payments. And here we find some more dangerous metaphors. We have all read tens, hundreds, and in my case, thousands of times, phrases such as money is flowing into or out of markets. Money is, uh, markets are awash with liquidity. Markets are frozen. These metaphors are dangerous because they reinforce the false notion that money travels. When Euro dollars flow from London to Kenya, they do not board an aircraft at Heathrow and disembark in Nairobi. There is simply a series of accounting entries transferring the ownership of a dollar account balance from a UK resident to a Kenyan resident. The dollars stay, in some sense, in London. Now I've described an international transfer within a single domestic payment system in a single country, the Euro, Euro dollar market in London. Transfers within the Eurozone are quite similar. Indeed, the same infrastructure, target two, and the same pricing schedule is used for euro transfers within and between eurozone countries. It is thus interesting to examine the speed of those transactions equal for both intra and international because the eurozone represents the technical state of the art of what is possible for international transfers if the global payment system used one identical systems architecture. So here's some data from target two. Apart from the beginning of morning queue sorting that takes about half an hour, the median transfer takes 26 seconds and 99.9% .9 of transfers take less than 45 seconds. Now those are pretty fast transfers, but a far cry from half the speed of light. There are two, there are two broad factors that slow payments. The first already mentioned is the early morning queue. Target two is not open 24 seven. So there are quite a lot of transfer requests waiting to be executed at the start of the day. A complicated algorithm sorts out the request and tries to net incoming and outgoing transfer requests bank by bank with the aim of selecting the most efficient transfer sequence, it's sort of like an air, air traffic control system. We return to our bus analogy. Anyone who has ever taken a bus or a plane knows that it takes quite some time to board and unload the passengers. Even if it took only five minutes to load and five minutes to unload a hypothetical bus, that would be 125,000 times longer 
than the time spent riding the bus. Hence, the people moving potential is dramatically reduced by the queuing process. Second reason, and this is particularly the case for international payments, is that it takes various algorithms and validation systems time to verify the encrypted instructions, cross-check various items, pass through automated controls, and deal with money laundering and financing of terrorism uh, concerns. With cross-currency international transactions, one has the added difficulties of dealing often with intermediaries in two different payment systems. And there is the matter of determining the exchange rate and synchronizing the two legs of the transaction, potentially between time zones where the local payment systems are not in contemporaneous operation. This latter task is facilitated today by the company CLS, which stands for Continuous Linked Settlement, that settles more than US $6 trillion in foreign exchange transactions in 18 currencies daily. CLS also queues payments to enable netting of participating entities, which are not only banks, by the way, thereby reducing the need for cash settlement by 96% on average. What that means is that of the $6 trillion in trades, only about $240 billion in funds actually cha changes hands or ownership. The processing, some of it's still manual, amounts to analogous customs and immigration controls on cross-border physical traffic. Though it's never actually taken me longer to fly to, to England than it's taken me to get through customs and immigration at Heathrow, I've come close. International transactions are also hampered by the antiquity of some of the legacy components of the various domestic payment systems that comprise the global payments network. If you have ever tried to execute an international payments order, you are probably painfully aware of that. Most of you are too likely are likely too young to remember that there was a time when PC file names were limited to eight characters. You can imagine the limitations that impose. Today, smart contracts or smart money enable the introduction of considerably more information on each transfer request, but the world has not you know, adopted smart, smart contracts or smart money quite yet. The delays in processing international transfer requests are currently the most important roadblock being addressed by major central banks, including the Bank of Japan, ECB, Swiss National Bank, and Monetary Authority of Singapore being among the most uh, the central banks in the forefront of this. By the way, the joint research initiative run by the Bank of Japan and the ECB to examine the possible use of distributed ledger technology in financial market infrastructure, in particular to overcome the lack of interoperability of payment systems in different time zones, is called the Stella Project. Uh, no royalties to me, unfortunately. Let me now wrap up and summarize. The technologies that have enabled modern, modern payment systems to affect astonishingly high values of transfers are actually quite old. Netting of account balances has been practiced for over 500 years, electronic transfers for more than a century. Where the improvements still need to be made is in, so to speak, the last mile, the processing, validating, inspection, and accounting related to transfers. Much as in the boarding and, unload and unloading of our hyperdrive bus, this is where FinTech solutions will likely play a very important role in facilitating payments and connecting them to straight through accounting systems. Money is a dangerous word. Dangerous because the way it is used in our language transfixes our minds in a way that it undermines our ability to comprehend the fascinating modern payments landscape. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Peter. Um... Up next, uh, Joseph, would you like to take it away? Yeah, well, first of all, thank you so much, Peter. That was a great talk. And for, for those of you who want a more in-depth knowledge of it, Peter has a new paper, Some Alternate Monetary Facts, that uh, dived into it a little bit more. It's a great paper and accessible if, even if you're not a specialist. So I highly recommend that. Uh, so what I'll talk about, so my background is as a trader on the open market stack. So, so what I'll do is I'll talk about how the payment system operates from a more nuts and bolts level uh, to level the background for those of you who might not be as familiar with it. I'll talk about an example, how payments work domestically and then in internationally. And then I'll talk about new developments as Peter alluded to through the, I guess, distributed le lever uh, ledger technology where right now there's something new developed by the Bank of International Settlements 
called the Project Enbridge, which seems very promising in changing how international payments will eventually be made. So when you're thinking about payments, I think it's important to realize that there are different types of money in the world. And what you think of as money really depends on where you are in the financial system. So if you're not a bank like me or you or anyone else, what you think of as money is a bank deposit. It's So let's say you log into your bank at Barclays. That number you see there, that is a bank deposit. It's an IOU from the bank to you, and it's created by the bank. But what a bank thinks about as money, though, is different. What a bank thinks about as money are deposits at the central bank. So they're called reserves. So if you're Barclays, you would have, uh, let's say, pound deposits at the Bank of England as reserves. And that's what you would think of as money. So if I'm making a payment to, uh, let's say, someone else, it, from my perspective, I'm sending bank deposits from me to, let's say, Jim in the UK. And we're both in the UK sending pounds. The way that that would happen, well, there's two ways that can happen. So let's say that we both bank at Barclays. Then what would happen then is simply a transaction on the database of Barclays' computer. Like Peter mentioned, everything is just digital. So on the Barclays database, if I were to pay 100 pounds from me to Jim, Barclays would simply go into their database and say minus 100 pounds in my account and plus 100 pounds in Jim's account. That's all that happens in that payment. It's simply a shifting of um, digit, electronic digits, like a giant Excel file where Barclays basically toggles the database a little bit. Things become a little bit more complicated, though, if I'm making a payment to Jim and Jim doesn't bank with Barclays. Let's say Jim banks with, um, let's say, Nation Builder. I think that's a bank, or Nationwide. Um, so... In that case, then, when I make a payment to Jim, then Barclays has to make a payment to Jim's bank, Nation Builder. So when that happens, the thing is, though, because I, what I think of as money are bank deposits, I, it, it's different from what the banks think of as money. Banks think of money as reserves. So my bank has to make a payment in central bank money to, uh, to Jim's bank. And what that happens then is that Barclays then talks to the Bank of England and says, Bank of England, can you put 100 pounds in reserves from my account at the Bank of England to uh, Nation, Nation Builders Bank in account at the Bank of England? And so in that sense, um, reserves move along the balance sheet on the Bank of England's ledger. So instead of the transaction occurring on Barclays's ledger, it occurs at another level. It occurs at a higher level in central bank money on the ledger of the Bank of England. So the Bank of England then looks at its balance sheet, toggles the database, and moves 100 pounds in reserves from Barclays' account to uh, the, the other bank's account. And that's how payments are made if you're making payments from domestically from one bank to another. Um, things get a little bit more complicated, though, if, let's say, I'm in the U.S., I bank with J.P. Morgan, and I want to pay Jim, and Jim banks somewhere in the U.K., let's say, at Barclays. Now, let's say I want to move dollars from J.P. Morgan to, so, Barclays. How does that happen, then? So, again, there's, an, there's two ways this can happen. One is if you are a medium or small bank, you would go through what's called a correspondent banking system. So let's say, just for example, JP Morgan is a small bank. So JP Morgan then would have an account with another bank in the UK, let's say nationwide. I think it's nationwide or nationwide. I used to have an account there when I lived in the UK. So, so then JP Morgan would open up an account at a UK bank. That would be a correspondent account. So what would happen? So JP Morgan has an account at a bank in the UK nationwide. And if I were to pay Jim and Jim banks with Barclays, then I would say, tell JPM, I want to pay hundred pounds to Jim. And then JP Morgan will call up nationwide and say nationwide, I have some deposits at your bank. I want you to pay Jim in nationwide. 
and then okay, Jim and Barclays. And then nationwide, then we'll call up the Bank of England. And the Bank of England then will move reserves out of Barclays, 100 pounds, and into, into nationwide. Okay, I'm sorry. I, I'm getting this confused a little bit. So JP Morgan's bank is nationwide and Jim's bank is Barclays. And then JP Morgan will call up nationwide. Nationwide will call up the Bank of England. Bank of England then will move reserves out of nationwide into Barclays' account at the Bank of England. And then so it's through this correspondence system, this chain of payments where international payments happen if you are meeting more small bank. And in practice, this is actually pretty costly and it takes time as well. And there's always a security issue as well. For example, sometimes maybe um, if you have fraud or maybe a bank goes under, there are issues like that where, where things could get complicated. Um, if you're a big bank on JP Morgan, and this is the other way that um, inter cross border bank payments can occur, is that JP Morgan itself would have an account at the Bank of England. And so if I'm trying to send payments to someone else in the UK, then JP Morgan, he has an account at the Bank of England and can directly make that payment themselves. So those are basically the two ways that you could have international payments today. Now, in practice, when you think about the international financial world, it's a very dollar-based system. So even though the dollar is just the currency of the US, it's actually the currency of global trade as well. Um, there's a very good paper by uh, Jita Gopanath of the IMF now, who talks about the um, dollar invoicing network. So in international trade, about 50% of um, trade is invoiced in dollars. So if you are, um, let's say, a Japanese company buying someone something from an Indonesian company, it's probably going to be made in dollars. The payment is going to be made in dollars. And if you just look at the global uh, global FX transactions, um, at about 90% of all FX transactions involve the dollar. So you can think of FX as really just trading your local currency against the dollar. So the thing about this system, because it's so dollar-based, um, the international payment system is really just the network of dollar correspondent banks. And that gives people like the US tremendous amounts of power. Now, shift away from the Bank of England as, as um, where all the payments happen, but focus on the New York Fed then. If all the payment networks are centered in the dollar, and obviously all dollar transactions, just like the Bank of England example, but this time for the Fed because it's in dollars, all the transactions, well, the bulk of transactions of international commerce in the world, thus settle on the books of the New York Fed. And that gives a country like the US tremendous amounts of power. So if you're thinking about international sanctions, that's really what um, many countries are afraid of. Uh, Iran, for example, the US says, we don't like you, you don't use our payments networks anymore. And now they're, they're kind of back to barter or trading things for oil. The same for other countries as well. And although it was not fully implemented in the case of the Russia sanctions, that would also have the potentials as well. And I think many countries don't like how this operates because one, it's a dollar-based system and the dollars are controlled by a correspondent network that's centered in New York. So now there are efforts by the international community to build new systems that I think are more uh, multipolar in how it's operated. And one such new system is what's called the Project Enbridge, which, is, which was uh, beta tested by the Bank of International Settlements, which is kind of like a central bank of central bankers or central bank for central banks. And what Project Enbridge is, it is a distributed ledger technology where the participants are A, the central banks, and B, the commercial banks. So how this would operate now, thinking back to the payments example, if you have an international payment, then you could just make it on this ledger. So um, going back to the example where I'm making a dollar payment to someone in the UK, uh, then JP Morgan would be have an account, a wallet on this uh, distributed ledger. And so would the Fed and so would Barclays and so would um, the Bank of England. Now, if JP Morgan wanted to make a payment to someone in the UK, he could take, let's say, CBDCs, um, pound denominated CBDCs, and send that payment directly to, say, Barclays, and they would both have wallets on this. So in a sense, it would it's kind of leveling the playing field, whereas everyone would have access to something very similar to an account at a foreign central bank. So if you were a small bank, 
previously dependent upon correspondent relationships, well, what happened then is you would have a more level playing field. Now, this is important in, in a couple of ways. One is that it levels obviously the level of access for small banks and large banks where everyone has more direct access to international payment networks without going through another layer. The second thing that's more interesting is that it makes it a lot easier for non-dollar networks to survive. So if you are, of course, like I mentioned, because internationally, most payments are made in dollars, the dollar network dominates. But if you have this multilateral layer of um, payment networks through a coordinated central bank ledger, then let's say you have a smaller currency and you want to make payments, uh, you want people to pay you in that currency. In the past, it was very difficult because you have to depend on a network of banks willingly having a have willingly to hold your currency and maybe there they don't want to register at, at that central bank and so forth. But now if you have this layer, then um, it, sign, it kind of levels the playing field in a sense and makes it more possible for uh, payments in non-dollar denominated currencies to, to grow. And so that's something that's I think is a new and important development looking forward since um, there seems to be more and more people who are, would like to have a, a payment system that is a little bit more multipolar. So uh, that's, I think, is the more interesting developments in the world. And right now, they just concluded their better trials, and eventually, they're, they're trying to grow that. Now, in addition to things like Enbridge, you also have competing national payment systems, uh, for example, like what's happening in China and in Russia, where they're trying to not build a multilateral system, but may, but extend their domestic payment system. So think about what the Fed is doing, except that uh, in another, another currency with their own sphere of influence. Uh, let's say uh, China extending their payment system to Russia, for example. And that also is, is an interesting development because you could have the infrastructure in place, although not necessarily the willingness of people to, uh, to transact in non-dollar currencies. And um, so those are the two developments that I think are really interesting. And that's all I have to talk about in this beginning statement. Uh, thank you, Joseph. Um, yeah, both very insightful introductory remarks and yeah, very excited to get into the minutiae of it. Um, I think I'll just start off by asking one or two questions before opening up to the floor. So my first question is on um, pretty much what Joseph touched on approaching the end of his remarks about the US dollar's exorbitant privilege. So I think uh, both you and Peter mentioned three things. One would be the possibility of decentralized ledgers like the Stellar Network. The second would be uh, more multilateral approaches like Project Enbridge. And the third would be competing national payment systems. So I was wondering, um, which alternative do you think is most likely to displace the USD as a dominant reserve currency? And what time scale are we looking at? Uh, Anyone feel free to stop. Okay. Well, I, I would, I, you know, I, I understand there are many people who would like to displace the U.S. dollar. I think that's very difficult, and, and at this moment, it seems, it seems unlikely by anyone else. So the reason is that in order to, to being a reserve currency, it's a lot more than having the payment infrastructure intact. Um, that's obviously a necessary condition. When, when, uh, when the BIS was running their project Enbridge, their multilateral DL you know, payment system, one of the things that I noted was that they, they, they placed constraints on how it could operate. Um, for example, you can only trade uh, if, if the current, if, so you, can, you can't really trade in a currency that is foreign to both counterparties. And I think the concern then was that if you had a distributed, if you had a multipolar, let's say um, CBDC like structure, what if everyone just went to hoard dollars? Uh, that would be that would be not good. So um, it, it's not just about having the pipes, but also having the willingness. One of the great privileges of the U.S. is that it has a very deep capital markets, and it has, um, compared to the rest of the world, probably pretty good rule of law. And so, um, if you're if you're having a, I mean, when you when you earn currency, foreign currency, and so forth. You want to have a place to be able to store it. And that's where the deep capital markets come in. You need to be able to park your money. There's really no other currency in the world that has capital markets as deep as the US, which is part of the reason why you see very a lot of foreign sovereigns, even those who are not friendly with the US, 
have to buy US treasuries. There's simply no other way, no other asset that can hold all that money. And of course, you don't you you feel like if you put your assets in dollars, they won't just disappear one day if someone doesn't like you because you could still sue them in court. Now, those are those two aspects are, are things that are, I think, at the moment so far unique to the US. So even if you have a good payment system, um, it, it seems like you still need the other two as well. Uh, thank you. Uh, Peter, we have anything to add? I had myself muted. Um, uh, just let me pick up on one thing that Joseph mentioned at the end about the US, the deep capital markets. And I think that's really, really important. Uh, let me share something that was taught to me a really long time ago. Uh, the professor was Ron, Ron McKinnon. And he made the point that, you know, if there are 150 currencies in the world, You've got, I, th I think it's a, a bit over 11,000 possible currency pairs. Now, back in that day, we didn't have, you know, PCs and all that. So that would have made like comp comp computing all of these different exchange rates actually quite, quite difficult. Um, but more importantly, uh, if you wanted to trade one of these sort of off, off the major currencies, like let's say the you wanted to trade Paraguayan Guarani for Laotian Kip. Uh, basically, there's no market for that. There's no really fundamental demand for you know that kind of a trade. So that market is really shallow. So if you were to, if somebody were to give you a price for that, the bid ask spreads would be very very high. It would be very expensive to do that. Let's say directly. So what happens in the world is you wind up, it's cheaper to convert your Paraguayan uh, currency into US dollar than convert US dollar into the Laotian dollar because there is a, there is a market, you know, it might not be a super deep market, but there is at least fairly deep market uh, for those bilateral trades. So coming back to this issue of, of uh, let's say the dollar don uh, dominance, in, in, in a sense, I, I, you, you can't really have 11,000 deep Rx markets in the world, <laughs> uh, 11,000, you know, sort of efficient, uh, you know, rules of law and legal systems or, or to know them all. So in, in a sense, I think, but I might be wrong, I think we're, we're likely to wind up in a system with at least a few dominant currencies simply because you can't have as many deep markets as you do have currencies or, or countries. I think it's the physical phenomenon or financial phenomenon. So that's part of, I think that's an important reason, you know, it's, it's certainly related to what Joseph was talking about, why the US is so important. It's simply because it, it has the uh, network in place, you know, people are familiar with it. They, they might know US law and their own law. Um, so it's a bit difficult to dislodge this but you could certainly, I could certainly imagine the euro, uh, the Chinese currency, you know, being a tri tripolar world. And then you would have a deep market, hopefully, between among those three or four countries. Uh, thanks, Peter. I'll just have one more question before passing the time to the floor. If anyone has any questions, uh, feel free to leave them in the chat or after. Uh, this segment, uh, feel free to unmute yourself and uh, raise a question. So my second question is uh, more towards um, monetary policy, uh, specifically in the US and Europe. I understand that both uh, Peter and Joseph, you are quite avid Fed watchers. And as we know from last week, the Fed raised the funds rate by 25 bips, while the BOE and ECB sort of diverge, uh, each raising their respective benchmark rates by 50 bips. Um, and I think the consensus seems to be that there is some divergence in how they are tackling inflation, how they perceive uh, expected inflation to evolve. For example, while Jay Powell and Andrew Bailey announced rates were close to their peak, uh, the ECB expects to raise its key rates by another 50 bits in March. So I was wondering whether you agree with the consensus that there seems to be a different understanding of inflation um, in the US and in Europe. 
And what do you think are the reasons for this divergence in policy decisions? Uh, you can disagree too. So Joseph is muted, so maybe I should start then. <laughs> um, oh yeah, go ahead. What, what I find, I, I'm finding myself being more critical of the Fed in recent years than I traditionally have been. And part, part of it, I guess, is the, what I see as kind of convenient packaging of messages for political purposes, let me put it that way. Uh, in, in, it, the problem or the, what I mean in, in very particular words is that everyone who's in, who's been involved in monetary policy making, monetary operations, understands that interest rate policy, and let me call it interest rate policy and not monetary policy, uh, because I've been on a rant against money here. So interest rate policy, uh, it takes a long time. You know, it's consensus would have been say, it takes 18 months more or less for uh, an increase in interest rates to have an impact on, on, the, on the real economy that you want, want it to have, okay? So basically when you're doing, when you're working through the models and, and adjusting your policy settings, you're always looking forward to, uh, to a year, year and a half, what you think it's going to be. It's a bit like, you know, if you're driving a car at 150 miles an hour, it, you, you can't avoid what's right in front of you. You've, you've got to be looking pretty far down the road to, to decide, you know, what to do. Um, and I found that when, when the, um, the, the Fed's kind of used the leads and lags when it's been convenient and forgotten about them when it's been convenient. So for example, in particular, uh, I, I find it really hard to understand if you really think you need to raise rates by a certain amount that you're not doing it much more rapidly than you have done, okay? Because it's gonna take a while to have its impact. So this notion that we're going to look at the data and so on and so forth. You know, if you, if you know you have to raise rates by 400 basis points, I'm not saying do it all in one meeting, but the idea of, I mean, the way this has been perceived by the media and so on, this has been the fastest increase in rates in 80 years or 50 years, whatever, it's, it's ridiculous. We've never been in a situation, well, I, I don't think in my lifetime, where inflation has gone, say, from zero to, to 10% in, in a few months, right? Um, so to, to say that, oh, we reacted quickly and decisively to that, I think, is, I think it's just a misrepresentation of what's, what's been happening. Um, so uh, I think, I'm not sure there's any real difference between you know, how they think of things in the ECB and the, in the U.S., but I would have preferred the U.S. to have, to have I, I would say, acted a bit more like the ECB in this case, like going, being a bit more forceful and um, convincing than um, this, uh, you know, language that we'll, we'll, we'll wait and see what happens kind of thing. I, mean, I, I agree with Peter. And I think it's really important to note, as Peter suggests, that monetary policy acts, acts with a lag. But I think something else that, that's really important to note is that um, the conduct of monetary policy, how it feeds through to the economy, it's, it's not really all about the, um, the overnight rate, the short-term rates, which is what the central banks adjust. But it's also about how the markets perceive the, the central bank. Um, for example, the Fed is hiking rates, and it's telling everyone that we're going to keep rates, you know, high throughout the year. We're going to stay higher for longer, um, but the markets are strongly perceiving that the Fed is going to cut rates later in the year and cut by, you know, fifty basis points, and that directly impacts the effect of monetary policy. Because let's say that you want to go out and you want to get a mortgage or something like that. Well, the rates that you face are the market rates are the rates the market provides, and the market is pricing in a lot of rate cuts. 
So in that sense, if you look back what's happened the past few months, uh, financial conditions have eased significantly. Uh, a few months ago in the US, you couldn't get, if you wanted a mortgage, it'd be above 7%. Now it's slightly below 6%, just a little bit. And that's because how policy affects the economy. It's not just what the Fed's, Fed says, but also how the market perceives the Fed. And um, as, uh, as Peter suggested, if the Fed came out a bit more forcefully, the market wouldn't have that perception. Um, so the problem with this is that um, if the market begins to ease, so to speak, even as the Fed does nothing, in, in effect, the Fed has also eased. And that means that it's possible um, for economic growth and inflation to reaccelerate again. Uh, when I when I look at this episode, it kind of explains to me why oftentimes we see that the Fed over tightens and, and goes gets into a recession, uh, because right now the market always thinks that the Fed is going to cut rates promptly, and so in order to get the right level of account, of um, restriction to slow things down, the Fed kind of has to compensate for that bias in the market by being a bit more restrictive than it otherwise would be. So it, it seems like this is kind of a I don't know, paradox a bit. About the other central banks, I also look at this from the perspective of how monetary policy feeds through to the economy. One of the things that's different about the US is that in the US, most people um, have long 30 year fixed rate mortgages that they can refinance anytime. And so when the Fed hikes rates, it doesn't impact the households that much because their rates are already locked for 30 years, and that's their largest liability for, for most households. But if you look at other countries, let's say some European countries or the UK or Canada, a lot of their mortgages are either shorter in tenor or floating. And so the central banks can have a, a much bigger impact on slowing the economy by doing a lot less than the Fed. And so that structurally changes, I guess, how um, how restrictive they have to be with their overnight rate to achieve the same impact as, as the Fed. And going forward, I'd expect to see more divergence between the central banks as these um, transmission mechanisms matter more as to, as to their stance of monetary policy. Thanks, Peter and uh, Joseph. Uh, I'll now open the floor to questions. I think we have one in the chat from Jan Amsterdam, um, would you like to unmute and ask the question yourself? If not, I'm happy to read it. Oh yeah, sure. I would. Um, I can share myself. Yeah, I was wondering um, because there's so much um, attention in the East about de-dollarizing. I think, and uh, the East is also very much focusing on gold, which is neutral money. So it's not the ruble or, or the yuan or whatever. Um, is there a possibility that uh, more countries will trade in in gold uh, as a currency? Uh, I read that Iran wants to settle trade with Russia uh, via a gold-backed stablecoin. And uh, I also read that uh, Ghana, Ghana is, is now... Uh, using gold to buy oil directly. And um, of course, China uh, has set up uh, a long time ago um, a new international gold exchange and a new gold price benchmark, which could facilitate things in this. Could gold maybe perhaps, um, you know, um, grab some share from the US dollar in terms of trade currency? Well, I think that's my, my own view is that I think the problem is that uh, one, as we noted earlier, that some countries have been cut off from the dollar system and the dollar system is the uh, the global currency of global international trade. So they're trying to find alternatives. The, the other problem is that um, when the US and the European powers were sanctioning the Russian central bank, they introduced country risk into their, into their um, sovereign assets. So if you are large, sovereign investor, you, you know, you, you can't really treat US treasuries or any US liability, a liability of the US government as, as risk free anymore. So that pushes them towards a scramble 
for alternatives. And, you know, gold is a, traditionally a monetary metal. So I, I think there's that thinking there. But I, I would also note, though, that what we think of as, as a safe asset, as, as money, is very cultural and very, I think, influenced by tradition. And before we went on the dollar standard, we were using gold as, as money. And so for many of us, um, yeah, instinctively, if we're looking for alternatives, we think of think back just uh, just a generation to gold. But if you look at how younger people are thinking about the world, you know, they're all into things like Bitcoin and, and cryptocurrencies. And so in searching for an alternative safe asset that's out of the fiat system, so to speak, for some people it would be gold, but it could be something else in the future uh, because ultimately it is something that is is cultural. I guess how part of the so I would I would put what Joseph said in a in two different ways. I guess one is uh, why not use Singapore Singapore dollar, Hong Kong dollar, and keep your accounts there and do your trading um, through there. Um, second, if if we are if we're talking about gold, I think you were suggesting it would be. Uh, stable coin linked to gold price or not we're not talking about moving physical gold uh, and in that case what makes a good unit of account is something that's pretty stable and gold is not terribly stable of course bitcoin is absolutely unstable uh, as a as sort of a unit of account so you probably would focus on an index of something else uh i'm not recommending the sdr as your stable index but you could if, if you're thinking of having a stable coin index to something you would want it to be something that i would think is more stable than than gold the gold price thanks thank you and thanks Jan, for that question i think we have another in the chat uh, from Vince. Uh, I'll just read it for the benefit of the recording, uh, but feel free to read it in the chat too. Uh, asking about your take on the markets following the unemployment numbers last Friday, could the Fed have seen potential weakness in the numbers that they are unwilling to further press the market on being hawkish and therefore shifting to a more data-dependent mode? Are they becoming more wary that the rate hikes have yet to fully transmit and what are your takes on potential credit and liquidity events happening in this tightening cycle? So I think it's a, a fact that the Fed, the Secretary of the Treasury, no, no one receives this data before it is uh, released. Uh, you, you might be somewhat interested in this, maybe not, but uh, when data such as this is released, including the Fed, the Fed uh, uh, decision, uh, journalists are brought into a room and are allowed to read the data and process the data. Uh, and then, then it is released to the public. They are in a room where it's, they can't communicate with anyone. Uh, so if you ever wondered why people seem to be saying coherent things 30 seconds after the numbers come out, it's because they there are some people who see them before they come out, but they're not allowed to talk to anyone. Um, but just coming back to could the could the Fed have been looking at data, you know, apart from the official data that would lead them to believe that, uh, you know, the the um, labor market is moving in a certain way, and acted because of that. Um, I tend to doubt that they would be doing a lot on sort of one data point. The data in the U.S. and I, I suspect maybe I'm wrong. The U.S. data is pretty reliable. But U.S. data is subject to pretty significant revisions. Uh, of, of course, the media doesn't pay attention to that very much. But a lot of this data is revised over time. So I think if you're an experienced policymaker, you're taking all this with a grain of salt and incorporating it with a lot of other information. But I think um, you know there is a there is a concern. And I would highlight. Joseph didn't mention this, but. You know, in my in my small understanding of how models are built, if you can imagine the Fed, the model of transmission of interest rate policy in the in the U.S., 
was based on looking at reactions to changes in the Fed funds rate. And there was recently a presidential address at the American, American Economic Association convention by Christina Romer, uh, looking back and trying to identify episodes where we can truly say the market was surprised by an increase or decrease in the Fed funds rate. And there really aren't that many, you know, maybe there were 14 in the last hundred years. So those models are based on sort of the transmission of the Fed funds rate through the economy. And I would say, I don't think it's controversial that since about 2010 in the US, the Fed's funds market has really not been a, a market, so to speak. I mean, I don't want to spend time into going, going into this, but it, it's very different, I think, giving a very different kind of signal than it was before. And you can imagine all the models being updated in the last 10 years. Well, they can't, I would say, rely on the Fed funds rate uh, transmission, sort of modeling that, uh, calibrating the models based on that. So I think we are, and we did just come through the COVID trial. So I think there's a tremendous amount of uncertainty in terms of uh, what, what a model would say uh, is likely to happen un under these circumstances. And I would say there's a lot of anxiety about you know, this notion and people don't like to talk about it. Uh, how high might the unemployment rate have to go to you know, stop inflation or you know, turn, turn the page or get the Fed back to 2%. And no one knows that. Uh, and uh, I think the wise people know that they don't know that. So it's very difficult, uh, you know, discussion about predicting how high the Fed funds rate would have to go both on the two, the two aspects. One is, as Joseph said, you know, the transmission mechanism uh, is not the same as it used to be. Uh, we're not really sure what, what's going on now. And um, and combine that with balance sheet policy, quantitative easing, quantitative tightening. We don't, no one knows how that works in the US, uh, I would say. So we're really operating with new instruments that we don't really have any good calibration for in a circumstance that we is unprecedented. So they're being, I think they're being cautious, but in the wrong way, I would say. <laughs> uh, uh, I would say they should say, look, we don't really know. We're going to raise rates. If the economy starts slowing down, we can always cut them. But I think the danger, the danger is if you, you go too slow and then you find out a year from now that uh, you know, inflation didn't come down, then you're going to have to convince the market somehow. <laughs> uh, you know, as Joseph was saying, the market doesn't seem convinced that you're willing to pay the price to bring down inflation. It's going to be even worse. Right? You're going to have to do something really dramatic. And what people have in their cultural memory in the US is we don't want to get a situation that Paul Volcker faced where he had to essentially orchestrate a, a huge recession to get this inflation inertia out of the economy. I agree with to what Peter was saying. And I'd also note that, you know, just from a broader political economy um, standpoint, so let's say that there is a trade-off between inflation and unemployment. So it's ultimately a, a cultural and political decision to, as to how much unemployment is acceptable to get inflation down. And that's, that's, a, that's a question that's hard to answer. And in order to, to get a sense of that, you kind of have to look at who sits on the FOMC. So. The FOMC people, people on the who vote on the Fed's decision-making body are political appointments. And what you'll note, though, is that the Biden administration has had a lot of opportunity to, to remake the, the board of the Fed, and they've made a lot of appointments there. Uh, so it's, it's commonly perceived that the Biden administration is, is more, I guess, left-leaning, and that kind of suggests that their trade-off when they draw it would be on the air of side of, uh, let's say it's okay to have a little bit more inflation. Um, it's really bad to have a lot of unemployment. And you can kind of see them setting the default rules as in that sense. And you can also very clearly see their, their mark on how, uh, on climate change, for example, where the Fed now is thinking of taking into account climate change in their banking regulations. 
in the past year, when inflation was 7 8% and the federal funds rate was zero, it was really easy to get even the most dovish or left-leaning member on the FOMC to agree with rate hikes. Now we're about you know four and three quarters, and some indications that the economy may be slowing. I think it's a lot harder to get consensus on the FOMC, and the biases of individual voting members may become more important in, in shaping how they make that trade-off. And so that's that's something that we have to keep in mind as well. Uh, broadly speaking, you know, inflation growth that's that's a political economy choice. So it's not something that's necessarily going to be in the numbers. Um, I also agree with um, with what Peter mentioned about how policy is transmitted. You know, the federal funds rate that's historically how the Fed manages the economy. That's that's just not how things work anymore. And, and part of it's um, intentional. So Basel III has all these new liquidity rules that essentially uh, strongly discouraged banks from borrowing from each other in the overnight unsecured market, which is what the federal funds market is. Um, that was meant to make the system safer, and it is much safer, but it also makes the Fed funds rate irrelevant. So policy is going to be transmitted through other means now, largely through, say, forward guidance and the balance sheet. And as Peter suggested, uh, no one at the Fed seems to know very and have a good idea how that works. And that's part of the impetus, it seems, to try to shrink the balance sheet and get back to using the overnight rate as a policy rate, since they seem to think they understand that better. The last part of the question as to where the weaknesses are in the system, I think that's a really good question, because if you ask market participants a couple of years ago, uh, could the Fed ever hike to four and a half, four and quarters, three percent, five and five percent, the answer would have been unambiguously no, something would blow up. And yet here we are and things seem to work very well. I think to the credit of the regulators, they've done a really good job in making the financial system stronger. The easiest way to see that is how during the COVID panic, um, the commercial banking sector was functioning very well and there was no problems at all. So the, the U.S. financial system is a lot more resilient than it was before. The one weak point that I've been writing about would be the, the treasury market. So earlier, um, let's say you know, a few months ago, uh, there was a lot of articles in the market talking about weakness in the treasury market. And if you look at the UK market, there seems to have been a liquidity event in the gilts market where gilt yields shot up significantly. That is to say, gilt prices declined precipitously. I think the sovereign debt markets are, are, are not very resilient. And the reason being is that over the past, uh, say, 10 years, the amount of issuance in the sovereign debt market has been very large. At the same time, the amount of liquidity in the market hasn't scaled in the same way. Just looking at the treasury market, for example, um, 20 years ago, let's say the treasury market averaged daily transactions in the cash market were about $400 billion. Average treasury, total treasuries outstanding was about let's say, six, seven trillion. And today, I, the treasury market is about 25 trillion outstanding and growing by a one to two, one to one and a half trillion every year. The average cash volume though has only grown slightly from 400 billion to 600 billion. So the market has grown rapidly and the underlying the, the size of the treasury market has grown rapidly, but the underlying liquidity and infrastructure to support it isn't there. So you have the potential for sharp accidents, like what happened in the UK gilt market to happen in, in the US or other sovereign debt markets as well. And um, so I think that that's the point of fragility that I would focus going forward. And there are efforts to try to reform that, but things move slowly. Thank you. Uh, we have another question from Kevin. Do you mind unmuting to ask a question? Oh, yeah. Can you guys hear me? Hello? Yeah, I can hear you fine. Okay, perfect. Uh, I just, uh, thanks for hosting this space again. Great space. Um, well, great Zoom again. So I have a question on, uh, so on the U.S. consumer going into the summer, we have we have uh, like the EBT food stamp benefits and going away March 23rd, right? We have almost four to five, I think it's four, either five million small business owner loans that have to be that have to start making their payments back. And uh, 
Then we have student loan repayments that which ends in June, I think we'll decide in June or we don't know if it will be pushed back to August. And the average consumer only has what four or $500 saved up. How, how, are, how, how will they be positioned or are there any, any default risk? Because uh, consumers are going to have to pay, you know, a lot more than what, whatever they're used to for the last two years because of, of all the support we're getting from the government. When all of that ends and all of that debt is starting to, it has to be paid back. How, what kind of economy are we looking into and unemployment wise? I don't know if I worded it properly. Yeah, you've definitely mentioned some key points of note that could suggest a slowing economy. But you know, there are you got to look at the other side as well. Job market is booming, wages is going higher. If you look at bank credit creation, it's really just have there's a tremendous credit boom going on where people are just you know borrowing a lot of money that 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 gives them you know money to spend. If you look at the asset markets, people who participate in them. Um, asset prices are, are elevated. Uh, household net worth is still very close to the highest ever. Um, so, I mean, there are, there are things that are, uh, you know, supportive of, of the economy as, as well. So uh, to me, it's, it's not super clear that, that the points that you mentioned would, would dominate going forward. And I think the reason why rate cuts are priced into the market is it seems when I look at the market, they often think that I guess the future looks like the past. And uh, you can most clearly see this when we were getting out of the rate financial crisis in 2009. Uh, in 2009, the markets were always pricing in rate hikes, you know, because pre GFC, Fed was always hiking to, you know, 4%. So the market was always thinking the market's going to market, Fed's going to hike to about 4% in the coming years. And the market was always very wrong. Um, fast forward to today, over the past few years, the Fed was always cutting rates. That's that's what they do, right? The Fed sees the market go down and they cut rates. That's what they did in 2019. Um, I think the market thinks that the future, again, looks like the past. And so that the Fed would be like the Fed. They've come to see the past several years that you know they will just cut rates very rapidly. And maybe they will, but again, market is not very good at getting any regime change or turning points in how the world works. So um, if the future does not look like the past, I think the market would be surprised. Joseph, could I ask you a question on, on that? But if, if we agree that, let's say the Fed funds rate target doesn't really matter anymore, then, then why, why do people care almost what, what the Fed's going to do with rate cuts? Is it a signal? Oh, signal deeper or, um, you know, what, what would be the mechanism for, in other words, why would the market say, like my, my thinking as well, Fed will raise rates to five, five and a quarter and just hold them there for a while, right? And why, why would you be cutting? So, so what would the market be? What, what what would what is the market thinking would prompt the Fed to, in in my mind, reverse up direction so fast it would it would be a little bit embarrassing actually. Uh, I well a couple responses to that. So I think policy is transmitted not through the federal funds rate but through the reverse repo facility rate. Since that is rate mm -hmm. that is the overnight risk free rate available to a wide swath of market participants. So and it's through that rate that um, let's say three, four, five-year interest rates are, are, are set. So if you are a large investor, you can invest every day overnight at the reverse repo facility rate, risk-free, or you could invest in, you know, some risky asset. So that's that's what sets, sets the cost of capital for them. And if you're looking at, let's say, three-year segment, the investment world looks, well, either I can roll every day at the reverse repo facility, or I can lock in a three-year uh, investments and so uh, my what I'm willing to accept for that three-year investment is going to be what I expect the path of the reverse repo facility rate to be. Now, why the market anticipates rate cuts? I think if you look at a, a wide set of market-based, uh, I guess, expectations of inflations, I think the expectation seems to be that inflation is going to go back down to two percent really quickly. 
And well, if if that's the case, then then it, it's it stands to reason that um, the Fed would be cutting rates very quickly since uh, mission accomplished, and there's no reason that you need rates that high. Um, from what I understand, talking to most professional uh, forecasters of inflation, it it seems unlikely that suddenly we get, I guess, immaculate disinflation is one of the ways they they put it back to two percent, and I think that's that's the difference. Not necessarily that there's going to be a calamity, but that uh, the Fed just uh, gets its job done much easier than than it's currently expecting. Uh, we have another question from Philippe. Uh, I'll just read his question as he PM'd me. Uh, what is the role of innovation zones such as NEOM in Saudi Arabia? in driving the future of new payments models and exporting technologies to the world to increase financial inclusion through technologies and services. Uh, also, what do you project for the future for green finance trading? So one specific question on innovation zones like Saudi Arabia's NEOMs on uh, improving new payment models and a second more general question on uh, the future of green finance trading. Uh, if anything's unclear, I will put this question in the chat. I, I can't speak to the Saudi Arabian uh, center, but on, on the green, the green uh, finance or the green finance trading, I, I'm not, I wouldn't answer this question directly, but I would say something that might sound counterintuitive. And that is there was a lot of pressure or concern, I think, in the West that central banks should be buying green green bonds and, and so on, that this should be put in their, their mandate. And my, my reaction to that was, no, that's exactly the wrong thing, because what you want is to develop a market for, for green bonds, right? There are people who are willing to take, let's say, a lower rate of return with the notion that they're going to get their hands on green bonds. And if, if the central bank is going to be gobbling them all up, then you know, that market won't develop because the central bank will be required, presumably, to hold on onto them. So if you look back through history, uh, yeah, it's true that sometimes central banks play a role in developing uh, new debt instruments by kind of putting uh, you know, buyback facilities or repo facilities for them. But you really don't want them to be held on the, you know, in balance sheets where they're they're never traded, because that then the green bonds will not only have a sort of a, a coupon discount, but they'll also have a, you know, a, a bad liquidity uh, discount. They'll be very liquid. So uh, it, it might sound surprising. And 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 if you look at countries who are probably doing this in the Thinking about this in the right way, I think Australia has some, you know, has thought these things through, and I don't think you'll see, you know, Reserve Bank of Australia going out and buying these bonds. I mean, the way to develop a, this market of bonds is to issue them, and uh, you know, reach a critical threshold of, uh, of liquidity where people people are not paying this uh, uh, price for them being illiquid. Maybe, maybe Joseph can speak to. I, I don't know how liquid the. Uh, the um, floating rate note market is in the U.S. When when did that start? Twenty fourteen, but typically in the U.S., sometimes a new instrument it, it takes decades to really get it developed. So the last thing in my mind you want is the central bank, or you know some government entity buying up all these all these bonds. Yeah, to Peter's point, I mean, let's say even the U.S. government market uh, recently relaunched the twenty year. U.S. Treasury bond, and it's not that liquid. It's actually, uh, when I was at the Fed, many people would call to complain about it. It takes a while to build up liquidity. And if you have someone gobbling up all the bonds, that doesn't help. Um, I think if you more concretely look at the ECB, I think they, they've they explicitly noted that, you know, they're going to have some preference. So the ECB is active in the corporate bond market and in the sovereign market to uh, purchase bonds of companies that are green rated, so to speak. So that's their way of subsidizing the sector. In the US, that this issue is, is a lot more controversial. And so uh, the public sector, the Fed has not explicitly done so. 
Uh, but the, the way that I think that the Fed is going about you know, being green is through banking regulations. And the way that this would work, for example, so if you're a bank, you, you make loans and, and so forth. And part, uh, how many, let's say your cost of capital or how profitable it is for you to make a loan is in part dependent on regulations. And uh, for example, if a loan to a certain sector or a certain loan type is rated to be highly risky, you would have to hold more capital against it. And that increases your costs and reduces your willingness to make that loans of, of that type. Um, if you have a layer of green regulation, for example, that uh, I guess penalizes or looks upon unfavorably loans to industries that are not green, then you could see that as a way to discourage not green activity. Uh, that seems to be the direction that, that it's going uh, in the U.S., although it's still preliminary. Uh, what's recently happened is the Fed has published a I guess a set of um, preliminary rules and how they how they look at greeting the financial system through the banking sector, and uh, it, it's still something that's very politically contentious. So it, it doesn't have as much support as in the case of the ECB, for example. So it's not necessarily something that will come to fruition. Great. Uh, can I check if anyone else has more questions? Feel free to just unmute and ask the question as well. If not, then I'll just ask one more question to round up the discussion. Uh, this will be on a more personal note. So uh, both uh, Peter and Joseph, you have advice, uh, you have experience working in uh, either central banking or in organizations managing uh, global settlements like the IMF. Uh, so I was wondering if you have any advice for people who are interested in working in either central banking or in an organization of that nature. I can talk about my experience at, at the Fed. So honestly, if you're interested in my, in my experience working at the public sector, it's much better off starting in the private sector. Um, you start off at the private sector, you will learn more, you will, I guess, advance more quickly. And you, have, if you want to go to the public sector later on, you can come in at, at a much higher level. Um, uh, that, that's just my experience working in the public sector. Um, that's what I would recommend, I guess. So speaking, speaking to the IMF, um... I think it's still the case, but it was certainly the case when I was there that with a few exceptions, it's very important to have a PhD. Uh, now, I personally don't think that's necessary. Uh, in fact, it might even be dangerous because you've spent a lot of time learning about theory and then you're uh, put in the real world and you suddenly have to adapt to that which is the kind of experience that Joseph was talking about. You've already been doing these things and not kind of making, making up things on, on the fly that you thought in theory can't possibly be the case, but actually are, are confronting you. Um, but that's pretty much the, the root, uh, I'm afraid. Uh, you can come in as a uh, midterm hire, but you unlike, uh, well, you could come in at a very high level, yes, but that's pretty rare. Um, you would come in as a sort of a mid-career hire and those people are kind of second-class citizens in my experience. So basically when you enter in a cohort at some place like the IMF or the World Bank, uh, you go through a special program and there's kind of a culture and a in a network that you form with your fellow in the World Bank, they're called young professionals. It used to be in the world and the IMF they're called uh, um, EPs. What I'm, I don't even remember what it stands for. Uh, so that's in terms of your career, that's really very important. You know, 20 years down the road, you're everyone's kind of rising at the same rate and they're they're in important spots. So uh, I would say, unfortunately, in, in a sense, at least to my knowledge for the IMF, you, you, you do need a PhD. The World Bank is different um, and uh, you know, there's, there's different things, but basically the, 
your educational qualifications matter a lot um, before you get there. As I said, whether that's actually needed or not, it's a bit uh, like the story of, uh, I, I know uh, a friend who worked at the Bank of England and then came to the IMF. And I believe his degree was in, uh, in might've been ancient languages from Cambridge or Oxford or something like that. And he was really a linguist and it really was very handy at the IMF um, because he worked in Iraq, you know, speaking Arabic and he can speak Russian and so on. But, uh, you know, that's, that's a bit rare for the IMF. I think for the Bank of England, I've, I've been told uh, that, you know, people have gotten to be governor without, uh, you know, coming in as a, as a, uh, you know, very low level employee without a, with, without a distinguished higher education. Let's, let's put it that way. You don't even need to be British too, right? <laughs> yeah. Uh, um, one thing to note, in the, at the Fed, they would hire people even if you're not a US citizen. So, but if you're at the ECB, for example, you would have to be a, a European national and, and the IMF and the BIS, of course, are, are open to all nationalities as well. So that could be a constraint for a more international audience like people in Cambridge. Mm -hmm. Great, yeah, thanks uh, Peter and Joseph for a really insightful discussion as well as uh, career advice. Um, unfortunately, that's all the time we have for today. Um, uh, just a shout out to our next event. If you're interested in attending more of our events, we have an in-person event this Wednesday on the 8th of February with Professor Ashwani Saif on the topic Cambridge Economics in the Post-Keynesian Era. Uh, and you can check out our socials for more information on that. Um, until then, thanks again, Peter and Joseph, uh, very much for coming and uh, goodbye, everyone. Thanks. Bye-bye, ciao. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Oh, thanks. Thanks for inviting. Of course. Thank you. Bye-bye.